Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, I'm Samar Razavi, Assistant Professor with the School of Environment and Sustainability and Department of Civil Engineering. On behalf of uh, Jeff McDonnell and myself, we'd like, to, uh, we'd like to welcome you to the second seminar of this week, of this year, fourth year seminar series in Breakthroughs for Water Security. As always, we'd like to thank Howard Twitter, Canada Excellence Research Chair, and Global Institute for Water Security for underwriting this uh, seminar series. Before I go ahead and introduce uh, our distinguished, distinguished speaker today, I just to uh, I just like to note that we have uh, we will have Susan Hubbard from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory uh, next week, and the lecture will be back to Convocation Hall. It is indeed a real pleasure to welcome a colleague and friend, Professor Hoshin Gupta of Saskatoon. Hoshin is a professor of systems analysis uh, in the Department of Hydrology and uh, Atmospheric Science at the University of Arizona, where he, has been, where he has been for around 30 years. He received PhD in systems and systems engineering from Case Western Reserve University in 1984. Hoshin has been an international thought leader in a systems analysis approaches for reconciling models with data with a particular focus on hydrologic, environmental, and earth systems modeling. He's among the pioneers of different systems approaches for hydrologic modeling. Uh, his seminal 1992 WR paper co-authored with Duan and Surushian uh, on optimization and parameter identification of models has revolutionized the field and has been cited so far around 2,500 times. He was also a pioneer in using data-driven methods such as neural network in hydrology, multi-criteria approaches to model development in uh, 90s, and more recently, diagnostic approaches in the same field. And now his leading work on uh, assessment and correction of model structural adequacy based on Bayesian and uh, information theoretic approaches. And I believe that's what we're going to hear about today. Not surprisingly, his research has been well recognized and brought him awards and recognition. He was awarded the 2014 Dalton Medal of the European Geophysical Union and the 2017 Robert Holton uh, Lecture Award of the American Meteorological Society. He's a fellow of American Geophysical Union and the and a fellow of Galileo Circle of the University of Arizona. His dedication to training HQP graduate students and postdocs is also impressive. More than 28 of his past students uh, have been already recruited into faculty positions and 11 to national laboratories and government agencies across the US. So on a personal note, Hoshin has also been a nice colleague and a mentor to me and significantly helped me develop my career in the first years of my academic life. Um, so it's an immense pleasure to have Hoshin here today with us in Saskatoon. Welcome Hoshin, I'll pass the floor to you. Thanks Saman for those kind words. Can you guys hear me? No? Yeah. Okay. So let me start with an apology. In a moment of courage, I put this very grandiose title my talk, The General Theory of Learning. And um, when I was putting it together, I kind of retrenched and went towards the general theory of learning um, to sort of hedge my bets a little bit. Um, but as you'll see, my, my interest is, 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 is generally in the issue of how we take what we think we know about the world and represent it in models and then help us to either make decisions or to learn more about the world. So um, recently I've been, uh, over my career, I've been trying to understand this problem and recently uh, working with some colleagues who introduced me to notions of information theory, started to feel like maybe I'm starting to make a little bit of progress in terms of understanding it for myself. And so the purpose of the ta this talk is just to try to share some of that with you uh, and hopefully uh, make it understandable. So let me start by uh, thanking um, Jeff and Howard for bringing me out here, uh, for having had the uh, insight to form this institute and, and all the wonderful things that you guys are doing here. Uh, 
also um, Saman, who has been my host, uh, uh, along with Jeff. Um, Saman and I had the fortune to work together on a very interesting idea that he brought uh, to discuss with me about sensitivity analysis. And recently, uh, Saman's published two uh, very interesting papers on this topic. So one of the world experts on sensitivity analysis right here. You can talk to him about uh, things related to that. Um, uh, the, this sort of idea about the information theory perspective, I started to introduce into the literature recently by working together with some of my students. Some of the background for this you can go and read about if you're interested. Um, and then some of the people I need to thank, uh, Gray Nearing, who was a graduate student of mine now at NASA, and also working at NCAR with Martin Clark. Stephen Weiss, who is, uh, was from Switzerland, uh, Delft in Switzerland, uh, Holland in Switzerland. And now actually you guys are fortunate, he's at UBC in Vancouver. Uh, you managed to recruit him over here. Uh, he does some very interesting work on this. And Uwe Eret, who's uh, at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, um, who has a background in physics and is helping me to see how physics and thermodynamics and all that inform some of these, these things. The other person I want to mention is Shervan, who's sitting in the audience here, who uh, has been working with me on some of these ideas about translating information theory ideas into hydrological or environmental science uh, context problems. So if I can't answer any questions, we'll, we'll ask Shervan, okay? All right, uh, but he's right here, and so arguably is, is again, one of the people who's leading the thoughts uh, on some of this stuff. So, uh, and then there's a bunch of people I work with around the world. Um, uh, um, okay. Let me say something about where I come from. This is my home base, University of Arizona. Uh, very dry, as you can see. Um, it used to be the Department of Hydrology and Water Resources. Uh, we recently merged hydrology and atmospheric sciences together. Um, we like to believe, rightly or wrongly, that we're sort of doing something leading here, hopefully, by getting uh, 50 years or so ago, hydrology and water resources is one of the first programs of its kind. And we've been trying to say, uh, yeah, you know, for years working in our disciplinary silos, it's about time that ended. And I think this is not new. A lot of universities around the world are starting to do this now. Uh, however, I should introduce you to some of my colleagues, um, people that I get to work with. It's an interesting place. I very much enjoyed it. Uh, I'm sure some of you know Jim Shuttleworth, who uh, sort of pioneered hydrometeorology, and Peter Trock, who works on the biosphere, Leo Hill Slopes. Um, so uh, I feel very fortunate to work with people who are willing to dress up and, and pose for pictures like this. <laughs> okay, so my background, as Saman mentioned, systems theory has been my interest. Um, specifically, I would say that I'm interested in what I call the learning problem. Um, and by learning, um, I'm interested in how humans learn, but then I'm also interested in how we can emulate or simulate that process on computers. Because as scientists, we use computers to help us do things which are not that easy to do in our heads. At some point, our brain becomes overloaded, um, and uh, uh, we need to start taking the collective uh, learning of multiple people put it together, and computer-based models is, is one of the, the useful ways to do that. Uh, I will point out, however, that I'm less interested in models as strategies for making predictions, uh, which I think of, of course, they're important for making predictions. I'm much more interested in models as strategies for learning. Okay. So in other words, the scientific process. And uh, to motivate that, you know, so let's say here's this is supposed to represent the environment. Typically, um, as scientists, uh, this is the kind of thing we've done. We go out, we interrogate the environment, we collect data, uh, we uh, study theories that other people uh, have had about this, we share that information. Eventually, we build mathematical models, we stick them into computers, and we run those models. And that's sort of the level of the interaction between the models and the environment. It's always through the person. And sort of what I'm interested in is saying, are there things that human beings do um, naturally, right? We all build models in our heads. Um, we all do it intuitively. Can we understand enough about that process of how we build good models uh, 
that we can start to emulate some of those processes uh, through artificial intelligence techniques or computer-based learning so that um, the computer can itself directly interrogate the environment, either through measurement processes and so on. And it's not to take the human out of the loop, but now to support the human in that learning process or for the human to support the computer in that learning process. More of a partnership, so to speak. Okay, so that's my holy grail, grand vision idea. Yeah. Um, here's a basic outline. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about what I think of as a model. Okay. Uh, there's a tendency for people, for all of us, to use language in very in ways that are very specific to us. And so in order to make sure that I'm communicating, I try to be a little bit more precise. So what's a model? And specifically, what's a model of a dynamical environmental system? Um, I'm going to talk about what I think, how I think we can characterize what is information and how that relates to models and data. Uh, I'm going to talk about the learning process, how we uh, use that information and our uncertainty about that information, uh, how information is then structured, how we build it into models. If we can th understand the, uh, that there's a systematic process by which we do it, we might be able to take advantage of that systematic process to help us understand when our models go wrong. Uh, that's the next topic, model failure, what could possibly go wrong. Uh, how, how do we do inference? Basically, modeling, learning is a process of trial and error. You make a guess about the world, you invariably fail to some extent. If you don't fail, you're not going to learn anything. So it's a great thing that you failed, right? The question is how to, take, how to use that information that you failed. And then this new idea that uh, myself and the colleagues I put up there are trying to develop and promote which is that there's a way to do this which might actually be more efficient than the ways that we've been doing up till now. And it's based on ideas of what I'm going to call maximum entropy approach, maximum entropy learning. Don't get scared by the word entropy. It's just a word that uh, has something to do with uh, uncertainty, right? So it has to do with reflecting what we really know and what we really don't know in as accurate a way as possible so that learning can proceed uh, in a reasonable way. And then finally, maybe some comments, uh, depending on how much time we have, on how we can improve the ways we use models in science. Okay, so models. Here's my definition. So a DESM, this Dynamic Environmental Systems Model, is always a simplified representation, right? Bear in mind, it's always simplified. It's a representation of the structure and function of any system, or dynamical system in this case. And according to me, it should do three things for it to be a useful model. One is it enables simulation. And those simulations must be good enough that you're happy with the results and you can use them for decisions. They should be, test they should, they should, you should be able to use the model to make testable predictions of what happens under new circumstances. Otherwise, it's not terribly useful. And finally, it should allow you to do reasoning. Okay. So, Depending on your interest in science, you might be interested in making predictions, but somebody else might be just, okay, predictions are great, but I really want to understand how the system works. Can I use the model to help me dig into that system and figure out what I don't know, what I need to know, maybe understand things about the system I didn't know before? That's the reasoning part of this. And it does that by encoding various kinds of information or knowledge. One is about physics. So physics are laws, principles about the universe that we believe to hold true generally. So we would hope our models would obey those laws. Uh, we encode knowledge about system properties, what's the geometry of the system, how the material is distributed, what are the properties of those materials, and so on. And finally, and this is the part that I think tends to get um, uh, forgotten when we build models, or not represented well enough, in principle, a good model should represent our uncertainty about the things. In other words, it should build in as much as possible what we know that we don't know. Okay? And that's the part which tends to get left out of models. We tend to build in only what we think we know, and we ignore this part. And so I'm going to sort of emphasize that aspect in our talks. Um, it's not really a good hypothesis of the system if it doesn't reflect in it the fact that there are some things we know better than others, and uh, and so on. 
Okay. Um, why is it simplified? Because knowledge is always incomplete and uncertain. There's no way you'll ever have enough information about a system, except in some very rare cases. Um, the real system is what I would call infinite dimensional in the sense that if you want to completely represent it, you would need an infinite amount of memory in your computer. Okay. So, and we're always working with finite resources and needing to do compu computing in finite amount of time. Okay. So by definition, your model is going to be a simplified representation. And so if it gets everything perfectly right, if it doesn't get everything perfectly right, you shouldn't be surprised. Okay. All right. So intuitively, if you walk around and say uh, data or models, people have this notion that models and data codify knowledge about the world in the form of information. The question is, when you say my model contains information, what do you really mean? If I say, uh, if I use the word information, you use the word information, we might mean different things. Okay. Uh, so the question is how, how can I use this insight to improve my models? And given that models and data s seemingly codify information in some different ways, because a model and data look very different on the surface of them. Yeah. One is a string of numbers, possibly, and the other is a bunch of equations. What's the relationship between these numbers and these equations? Uh, how does learning happen? How do I take the new information that might be in the data and absorb it into my model to improve it? Okay, so that brings us to information. What's information? Okay. So if you just think about it a little bit and ask yourself what's information, you might arrive at this conclusion that I did, is that, well, information is sort of involved in the answers to questions. When I ask why and I get an answer or what or how or when or so on, it's somehow involved in the process of asking questions and getting answers. And then um, if those questions, if those answers have meaning to me, if they, they change something in me, which makes me feel like I'm now better informed than I was before, okay? Um, and the important thing over here is that if I say my data contains information or my model contains information, I've actually not made a complete statement. I've made a very a broad and uh, in, in essence untestable statement, or in a sense it's just tautologically true, right? And so it's not terribly useful. I always have to say about what, okay? So information is always about something, context matters, and arguably data is not information for me until it's viewed in a particular context. So I've got this gentleman over here and I give him the number 3.14 and I haven't given him enough context yet to interpret this number, right? Some people might say, well, that's the first letters of pi or something like that. But if I tell you it's stream flow in media cube per second, all of a sudden it starts to make sense. Okay, so so just saying my model has information or data has information by itself is not sufficient. I need to say information about what. Okay, context is important. Um, so in the context of models and data and learning, I would argue that any information is always about one of these three things. One is it's about values, which I'm going to use the notation y. The second is about relationships between things. And the third is about constraints or assumptions. Okay, So constraints, what do they do? Well, they say this value exists, but it only exists over the... It can only take on these values, not those values, for example. Okay, So a single data point in, encodes information about a value of something on the real number line. It's ordered. I can give you a bunch of data points, and those can encode information about the distribution of those values, how often they appear, or, or don't appear, what the mean is, what the spread is, and so on. Maybe what the correlation is. Um, I can have uh, uh, data points which are uh, co-ordered. So in this way, every value of x has a value of y associated with it. And now what that is telling me is something about the space-time ordered relationships amongst those values. So I believe there's a pattern there which allows me to say, well, if you tell me what x is, I can have a pretty good idea. I can tell you what y is. That's a relationship. And that's just in, in, implicit in the data. Or I might go further and believe that there is a fundamental relationship underlying that data that somehow gave rise to that data. So these are the space-time uh, relationships about variables that underlie those things that I'm trying to study. Okay. 
So we recognize this because that's what we do when we go out and collect data in the field and we try to analyze. And then, um, but, but, but so, so it not only tells me there's a relationship, it also tells me that if I know something about X and if I'm a little bit uncertain about what its value is, it tells me, gives me a pretty good way of guessing what the value Y is and how, how uncertain I would be about Y, okay? So that's a conditional relationship, X about Y. And if you couldn't do this, then we couldn't build models, right? Because we want to use rainfall to tell us what stream flow is or what soil moisture is. We want to transfer information about rainfall into a different kind of information. And that's what models do for us. Okay. So if we agree that that's information, information uh, codifies uh, uh, either values or relationships or constraints of various kinds, um, then how does learning actually happen? Okay, so simply put, we could say that learning occurs when we take data-based information, which is somehow um, a little bit further removed from understanding, and we translate it into model-based information, which somehow has contextual relevance for us, which we can understand. We use that to build ideas, theories, symbols we talk about with each other, right? Is very rarely do we just talk at the level of data. It's always at the level of a model of some kind. There's a whole field of al algorithmic information theory which talks about how to build models from data and so on. Not going to get into that. The main thing that's inter interesting and important here is that in order to go from data to models, we kind of have to make a bunch of assumptions. And any time, since I said earlier, uh, assumptions, constraints, etc., et are, um, are forms of information. Arguably, every time we add a constraint or an assumption, we're adding information to what's already in the data. Okay? And that's important to bear in mind because we might be interested in questions such as, uh, how much of this result is based on my assumptions versus what the data really told me about the system, right? Is it all, is it all just me making it up? Or is there real uh, uh, um, background from the real world projecting out into my, into my result? Okay. So, and then when does learning occur? It occurs when, uh, I would say, when our prior uncertainties change due to simulating new information. So, for example... Let's say I've got a prior idea about the relationship between X and Y, and that's the level of uncertainty in my knowledge about this, this relationship. Um, I add some new information. The fact of adding information is, is um, exemplified by the fact that this uncertainty has changed. If that uncertainty doesn't change, I would say I didn't learn anything. Nothing new happened. There was no new information in that data or whatever it is, assumption or model or constraint. So you go from the prior to the posterior, we're all familiar with Bayes' laws, some relationships, statistical relationships between priors and posteriors and so on. Uh, the important point I want to make over here is that learning doesn't require the uncertainty to be uh, reduced. All it requires is for it to be changed, okay? So um, here's an example where the, uh, the lighter color is the prior and the darker color is the posterior. So B for before, A for after. So in this case, uncertainty has been reduced. Learning happened. In this case, uncertainty increased as a result of processing the new information. Learning happened, obviously. It's not what we like to happen, but it's, you know, if, if the prior was, was, was overconfident, then we would hope this would happen because it takes us in the direction of what's really correct, right? And then finally, um, you could just shift that uncertainty from here to here, and that's also learning, right? So um, there's a tendency for us to think our models are getting better just because the uncertainty reduces. And I would argue that's not the point. The point is that the uncertainty has changed, and, and it's the analysis of how that uncertainty has changed that helps characterize what we've actually learned from the process of interacting with the world. Okay. So, um, so we've talked about data, we've talked about models, we've talked about information, and we'll say the, the way that we know that there's information and the way that we can start to quantify how much information is in some assumption or model or data is by the extent to which the uncertainty has changed and the way that it changes. Okay? That, that's, that's sort of the working premise now. 
Um, there's also something I wanted to mention about this before we move on about the idea of information being bad. So there is some uh, discussion in the literature about uh, where they're saying there's a view that's been advanced which says information could be bad, they call it misinformation, and so on. Um, I used to have a definition of what I call bad information versus good information where I said, well, good information moves your uncertainty in the correct direction and bad information moves your uncertainty in the wrong direction. So you could argue that there's a sense in which there is. But arguably, it's probably more correct to say that uh, there's no such thing as misinformation. There's only misuse of information. Okay, Data is what it is. It contains information that it happens to contain. And the problem is whether I processed it correctly or not. So instead of blaming the data, we should blame our methods of interpretation, right? So um, if, we, if we do that carefully, then, then that keeps us hopefully, I think, on the right track. So uh, what we're interested in questions like, what can this new information tell me? And then there's a whole field of statistical information theory, logic, and so on, which is uh, really focused on this question. Uh, at least this is the way I interpret it, is I've got different kinds of information. How do I handle that information? That's what I would call that's what I would call estimation theory. Okay, so you can, and then there are certain rules. Well, if you're in a particular context, which like Bayes' law applies under certain assumptions about the world, and if those assumptions are not correct, then Bayes' law is the wrong rule for processing information. Just as an example. Okay. Okay. So with that that background, the question then becomes: Is how is information structured into models? And this is something that we've been thinking about for a little while. Um, and what we've arrived at, our, our hypothesis, our premise, or our argument, is that there is information in the models in the sense that those models uh, help to change our uncertainty about the world, okay? Hopefully reduce it, okay? Uh, and that information is encoded as a hierarch hierarchical sequence of decisions, each of which helps to constrain that uncertainty in a particular way, okay. So the uh, the first the first decision that we typically make when we want to build a model is we've got to decide what's the edge, the boundaries, what's the control volume that I'm going to use. Everything that outside is of no interest to me, except as it crosses the boundaries. I'm just going to model what's inside. So the first series of decisions has to do with the control volume. What are the physical laws that operate? What processes should I include? Something about system geometry. Something about material properties. Very general which I then draw up and I draw a little box, I draw a system diagram, here's the inputs, here are the outputs, here are the state variables, something like that. Once I've done that, I go, you know, but that's not enough detail. There's a lot of stuff going on inside that I care about. So then I start looking at three-dimensional spatial structure of organization within that box. How do I represent that? How much detail do I need to represent? Uh, that's the second level of decisions. Once I've done that, I have to tell you how fluxes flow amongst those parts. So I've got water accumulated here, and I've got energy accumulated here. But in order for the system to evolve, that the water has to be redistributed in some way. So what are those relationships which govern the movement of those state variables from one part of the model to another? I need to encode, as I said, something about information, uh, sorry, about the uncertainty about things that I don't know, a part that's often ignored. And then I need to put in some kind of numerical solution methodology to solve this whole thing. So let's look at the first step. Uh, conservation law, I call this the conservation law hypothesis. Okay. Uh, I put in physics, uh, physical properties, system geometry, and so on. Basically, I'm, ask, I'm answering the question, I'm going to build a knowledge of the system. What's important enough about the system that I need to represent it, and what can I ignore? Right? I'm making that assumption to demark, uh, to, to separate the world into things I include and things I don't include. So, for example, if you're studying a watershed, come over here. If you're studying a watershed over here, I'm going to put in some knowledge about the physical structure of the watershed, and I will put in some knowledge about the process structure of how things flow from one part of the watershed to the other, and then that becomes my conceptual model. And as we were discussing earlier in the, in the class, that is a useful representation of the system that I can now use to discuss with other people, talk about the system. And we can uh, argue or discuss as to whether I've got the right physical structure, the right process structure, and so on and so forth. 
And once I've done that, that conditions everything I do afterwards. Okay? Um, and then I can represent that if I'm a systems person, if you're, if you're a physical hydrologist, you'll draw a picture like this. If you're somebody like me, you'll draw a picture like this. Okay? It's just a different representation using a box, a state variables, inputs, outputs, some constraints on the values of those variables, and some conservation law which governs the evolution. Okay? Now, I'm talking specifically about uh, physics-based dynamic or environmental systems models. If you're building models of social systems, um, the conservation laws might be different. You might not be using conservation of mass, energy, and momentum. It might be something else. But still, you need to figure out what are those conservation principles that govern the behavior of the system. Okay? Once you've done that, I'll call that the conservation law hypothesis, and I can draw the system diagram. Okay. At the next step, I go, okay, but that's just a very coarse overview. It doesn't give me enough detail about how the system evolves. I need to now do something to break it up into bits and pieces. I can't break it into such fine components that, they, that it requires too much memory and computational power on my computer. So I need to compromise somewhere. Okay. Also, I may not have enough data to be able to, to inform that model. So what's a sufficiently complex, finite dimensional, spatially organized representation of the subsystem structure? Right? So if you're a person who believes in huge amount of physical detail, you might go into a very detailed finite element, in this case tin-based uh, representation where physics applies to every node, and you need to know topography, you need to know sans clay fraction distributions, or you need to know uh, porosities and all kinds of other things. Yeah? Or you might decide, you know what, that's way beyond my, my pay grade. I'm just going to model this with a bunch of simple boxes which represent conceptually flows in the system, and that's good enough for me. Okay? Arguably, we sort of start with simpler models and then we work that way. But I'm sure you've all met people who want to do it this way and work. And then they go, oh, I can't work with that, and then they sort of simplify. Okay. All right. So the result is what I call a system architecture hypothesis. You've got a conservation law hypothesis, and now you're saying, in order to represent the behavior of the system, I need to break it up into parts, and this is my hypothesis about how many parts and how they're organized. Okay. Once I've done that, I then need to specify what I call the process parameterization hypothesis. So up till now, what I've built is and shown you is a conceptual representation of the system, but I can't do computing. There's no equations in there, right? Maybe the conservation principle. But I can't actually do any computing. So I need to put in equations which tell me under what conditions things flow from one part of the system to another, how those dynamics evolve. Okay? So what mathematical forms do I use for these process parameterization equations at the architectural scale of interest? The field hydrologist collects the data, they go back to the lab, and then they need to do this. Uh, arguably, you could probably get a paper published without doing this, but usually you, you come up with some representation or you modify somebody else's equation and you publish it, you test it, and then that becomes your paper, right? Okay. Um, so what are those mathematical forms we should use? What variables to include and so on. So I'm just going to represent this using this symbology. I promise you it won't be a lot of equations. But basically I've got some, some buildup of state variables here. I've got state variables there. And there's something about the pressure differential or the energy differential or something in between one part of the system which causes uh, mass energy or information to flow from one part of the system to another. Okay. If there's, no, if there's no difference, there's no flow. So there has to be a difference. And that flow is trying to dissolve that difference. Okay? And that's what your process parameterization equation is trying to characterize. Okay? Notice, um, oh, one thing I wanted to add here. Notice that this equation came about at a late stage of building my model. You might argue, a lot of people argue this is the important stage. But I would argue that the earlier stages were equally important because you couldn't have done this until you did the previous stages. And notice that this equation now has some representation between the, the, uh, the, the pressure differential, uh, for example, and the flux. And now the, equation, the parameters appear in this equation, little things that you can tune, which supposedly represent things about the material heterogeneity, the geometry of the system, and so on and so forth. But I'd like to point out that they're actually artifacts of this mathematical process. right? 
you might like to believe that parameters exist in the real world. In reality, they don't. They exist as a process, part of your conceptual process of building this model. So if you used a different equation, you'd have parameters that meant something different, right? And the question is, how do you, how do you infer something about their values? Um, then uncertainty, of course, what we know that we don't know precisely or at all. What uncertainty is important, how to represent them mathematically. Uh, we need to, you know, we've got uncertainties in the system architecture, hypothesis, uncertainties in the input, uncertainties in the process parameterization, uncertainties in the values of the parameters. Just about everything is uncertain. And we've got to figure out a way to characterize all of that in our model. Okay? So we've got some kind of uncertainty hypothesis, good, bad, or ugly. And then finally, we need to figure out how do we integrate these equations in space and time and solve them. I'm not going to say a lot about that. This is just a placeholder to say, now I've got equations, I need to figure out how to solve them. Usually, our modern models are analytically so complicated that I can't just, uh, I can't just give them to a mathematician and they turn them around and give us the answer. I need to stick them through a computer and solve them for special cases. Yep. Digital solution or numerical solution. And the overall result is a computational model. Um, I'll call that the overall, overall system hypothesis, OS. And the important thing I, want to, want, I was trying to get to over here is that there's a structured hierarchy of the conservation law hypothesis, the system architecture hypothesis, the process parameterization, and then the uncertainty, each of which depended on the previous step. Okay. All right. So that gives us a way to think about models instead of them being black boxes, it gives us a way to sort of organize our understanding of how models are constructed and how they might be built. And if you're comparing two models, you might be able to compare them in terms of these different levels. One model might only represent conservation law of mass, whereas another one might do mass and energy. Did they gain anything by including both mass and energy, and so on and so forth. Uh, one might have a very detailed system architecture hypothesis, and one, the other one might have a very a coarse representation. Did you gain a lot by going from detail to coarse or vice versa? Um, the important thing is that information is added at each step in the sense that I talked about earlier, meaning that your uncertainty has changed. The moment I, moment I pose conservation laws, I'm saying that there is a very specific set of trajectories, relationships between the inputs, the states, and the outputs, and only those trajectories are possible that obey conservation principles. So not everything can happen. So uncertainty has been, uh, information has been added by the fact that it's reduced my uncertainty about what part of the world is actually accessible. When I add the system architecture, I'm now adding lots more bits and pieces. So, uh, so now I'm adding further restrictions on the possible trajectories that can take place. And so obviously my job as a scientist is to come up with a system architecture which does that in a meaningful way and restricts the trajectories to ones that are make sense, as opposed to ones that don't make sense. Um, it also gives you, whereas this, this representation didn't give you any information about spatial variability, all of a sudden I've got information about spatial distribution, which I didn't have before, okay? just by virtue of having built in that hypothesis. Uh, the process parameterization then further restricts those trajectories to only the ones that obey those particular mathematical equations. And it also introduces parameters which allow you to tweak things, move them around. The uh, specification of uncertainty then characterizes and quantifies your known unknowns. Of course, you still have the problem of unknown unknowns, but that's outside the realm of modeling in some sense. Um, and then the solution procedure converts all of that into very specific trajectories that you can examine and compare with the real world. Okay. So, what could possibly go wrong? Clearly, um, if we make hypotheses that are unjustifiably strong, the problem can become overconstrained. Okay? So all of a sudden, my model starts to diverge from reality, starts to give me predictions or simulations of the world that look maybe something like, but not quite like, the data that I've been collecting about the world. Uh, this could happen because I've neglected heterogeneity in the system that's actually important. I've simplified and said everything is uniform. I don't care. It doesn't matter. The heterogeneity is not important. It could be because I've oversimplified the system architecture. 
I actually needed five boxes organized in a particular way and I only put in two. And so I missed something interesting that was happening inside the system. Um, I could put in the wrong process equations that relate those dissipation of fluxes, uh, dissipation of gradients to fluxes, the wrong forms of them. I chose a particular evapotranspiration equation and it wasn't the quite cr correct one for uh, C4 plants in, in Arizona, right? Or something like that, okay? Um, I put in deterministic relationships for the relationships between the gradients and the fluxes instead of stochastic ones. In other words, I assumed that those relationships are perfect, when in reality, I don't know that they're perfect. I don't exactly know what they are. So I should probably use probabilistic or stochastic relationships to reflect my uncertainty in those. Um, on the other side, the problem can remain under constrained. We've got a lack of knowledge, so there may not be enough information there to constrain the uncertain space sufficiently. Um, I may not know what the correct process physics is at the scale at which I want to build my model. So maybe I did soil uh, experiments in the lab, and I know that Darcy's law works pretty well at, let's say, 10 cubic centimeters or a cubic meter or something. All of a sudden, I'm trying to apply the principles of Darcy's uh, law at 100 square kilometers. I made a whole bunch of assumptions that the system is uniform, there's no fracturing, uh, there's no uh, preferential flow pathways, et cetera, et cetera. And so maybe that simple linear relationship of Darcy's law is no longer applicable at this large scale. I just took it at one scale and transferred it to another. Uh, I don't know enough about the heterogeneity of the material properties and geometry. Uh, for example, I don't know about the fracturing that's going on. And um, at the scale of the elements, and then I actually don't know anything about it at the scale smaller than the elements which is actually typically one of the biggest problems that we have. Okay. Um, so what's happening in my model? Arguably some combination of both. And the question, the, the, the challenge of estimation is to figure out in what ways have I over-constrained the system and how, what ways have I under-constrained the system. This is a difficult task. I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm just trying to put some structure to understanding it so we can try to figure it out. Yeah? So if all goes well, Conservation law hypothesis, system architecture hypothesis, uh, process parameterization hypothesis, let's say the red dots are my data. If everything goes well, I progressively reduce my uncertainty, and so it converges around the data, and I go, gee, what a great modeler I am, or scientist I am, I built this perfect model, I can go home. Right? Um, I would argue that probably almost nobody has ever seen this happen in reality. And what actually happens is something like this, where here's my data and things start to converge, but at some point they start to diverge from what the data is telling us is actually happening. Yeah. And now I don't know. Was the problem originally with my data? Was the problem with my conservation law hypothesis? Was the problem with my system architecture hypothesis? Was the problem with the process parameterization equations that I put in? Right, I've got to now navigate this complicated uh, maze of hypotheses to try to figure out uh, how to improve my model. Okay. So the process of inference is arguably in, it's a fancy word which just means learning by try, assess and try again, trial and error, right? You try something, you make a guess, and if it works, hopefully you've learned something, if not, you try again. Okay. Hopefully we can do that in some kind of educated way, that's the whole point of building some kind of uh, uh, artificial intelligence or learning system. What's the first thing we typically do? Um, we make a hypothesis about the system and we collect some system data and then we, we collect the like, we compute what's called the likelihood that that data could have been generated by our system and we evaluate that likelihood and we go back and we correct the model hypothesis. That, that's sort of the general uh, loop of learning that occurs. Um, the first thing we might do, hopefully, that we all do, is we check our data. And we've all made assumptions about the data, and the first thing we should do is check to make sure that the assumptions that we made about the data are reasonable. If, in fact, we assume that the data was reliable, and in fact, parts of it were not reliable, we should reflect that in our analysis, right? Uh, 
um, uh, all of a sudden uh, you get these strange step jumps in the data. Um, uh, maybe the person collecting the data on that particular day decided they were not going to go out that day at lunchtime. They wanted to go out and have a beer instead, and so they just filled in a number on the on the chart, right? <laughs> so you you got to you always you got to go back to the data and you got to check it first. Yeah? Um, if you can reasonably assume that the data is correct, then uh, the next thing most people try to do is they go, well, something wrong with my parameters. Let me tweak the parameters a little bit. Let's see if I can get things a little bit better. Right? So you do either state or parameter estimation. You toss, an op you, you toss an objective function in there. You toss an optimization algorithm. This is where I started my career, as, as, as Haman pointed out. And you try that. And if it works, you go home, have another beer. If it doesn't work, you say, okay, got to go back to the drawing board tomorrow. Right? So that doesn't work. So in doing that, you assumed that all of this stuff is correct and the only the problem is here at the end of the chain. If that doesn't work, you might say, well, looks like maybe I put in the wrong equations. Okay? You get a little bit further along, you're no longer a master's student or a PhD student, maybe you're a postdoc. Gee, great, now I can tweak the equations. I can, I've got enough credibility here that I can propose a new equation, right? Okay, so you test that. Uh, you reread the literature, you do more field work, you try other guesses. That doesn't work, then you go, okay, I gotta, re I gotta relax things. Maybe I just didn't put in enough detail into my system architecture. I back up a little bit. Oh yeah, we forgot something. What was it that Jeff, you guys discovered? Oh, well there's, there's um, little dips in the, in the, um, uh, uh, in the bedrock and the water collects in there and we didn't represent that in our models so let's stick those in as new state variables, right? And a new understanding, a better understanding of the geometry and architecture of the system. Um, but one of the interesting things that happens at this stage is um, because I can't do computing without putting in equations, every time I change the system architecture I need to put in equations. So how do I know if the new information was better information was because of the better equations or was because of the system architecture? We run into this problem of trying to distinguish uh, causes, sources. Okay. So here's where we get to what we're proposing or calling the maximum entropy approach to learning using models. So what's a maximum entropy approach? Let me try to clarify that first of all. As I said, our um, our, our systems, uh, our models are coding information as a hierarchical sequence of decisions. The idea in a maximum entropy approach is that at each of these stages, rather than put in uh, a very strong guess about what's happening, we ask the question, what do I really know? What can I trust about the system? And what don't I know? And let me reflect in my model everything that is possible that could happen in this range of uncertainty. Okay, So instead of building in a deterministic equation, I would build in something which reflects my uncertainty about the system at that stage. Okay, So what I would call an informationally justifiable approach. In other words, I, I, I approach this from the point of view of... I approach this from the point of view of... Um, constraining my system inwards progressively, reducing my uncertainty, rather than starting with a very strong guess, being wrong, and then having to figure out how to back off. Okay. Those are two, two valid strategies for learning. Okay, but this strategy allows me to progressively come in, and usually it's a lot easier for me to make statements about how confident I am about a particular representation of a process than I am about saying, where did something go wrong? It's usually, it's, at least that's our hypothesis, okay? So the idea is you use what are called maximal entropy assumptions, um, which only add as much information to this model as justified by our available evidence at that particular space-time scale. So if I know that something like Darcy's law operates, but I don't know for sure that it's linear, I don't constrain it to be linear but I constrain it by some principles, which I'll talk about. So for example, I know in general from thermodynamics that any flux parameterization must have this general form. If X is the gradient to be dispersed, 
this is just a simple representation. It says that there's a particular conductivity or resistance to deflect to dissipating that gradient. So my flux is going to be conductivity times the gradient. That's going to be my general representation. Notice that I'm not saying it's a constant. It could change with time. Okay. But that's a general formulation. So any flux parameterization in any model that I've ever encountered generally has this form. Okay. A basic principle of thermodynamics, as I pointed out. Um, then I know because I need to conserve mass that the amount of water flowing out or whatever can't be larger than the amount that's actually there. So I've got some constraints, for example, over here, that uh, which impose a constraint on the value of k. k has to be between 0 and 1. Um, then I can argue that this value k as a func actually varies as a function of the state, but it has to vary only in a monotonic non-decreasing form because as I increase the, um, the gradient, uh, the pressure gradient, I would expect the flux to increase. Okay, So there's a restriction on the mathematical form of this. It has to be monotonically non-decreasing, consistent with the physical principle that larger gradients give rise to larger fluxes. And finally, if I really am honest with myself, I would go that because I'm modeling the system at a particular scale, there's always going to be things about things that are happening at smaller scales than the scale at which I'm modeling, which I don't know. And if that's true, every time I run the system, there's going to be a slightly different initial condition when I apply that, that, that pressure head or that differential. So this relationship should actually always be stochastic or probabilistic, reflecting what I know about the system. Okay, so if you take all of that and put it together, um, the idea then is that now for any system architecture that I choose, I can actually begin to build process parameterization relationships which obey physics, right? They obey physics, that's the important thing. But uh, they reflect the fact that I'm not exactly sure about the shape of that relationship. So I can now... Whereas previously I might go and I might sample ra parameters randomly from a set of parameters, I actually just go and sample functions randomly from a set of functions, all of which obey the particular physical principles that are required to operate at that particular scale for that particular process. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'll have some kind of a random function uh, generator, and I will put constraints on that random function generator. And it'll go in there and it'll, it'll sample functions which obey particular smoothness properties. Maybe it's only allowed to increase. Maybe it's allowed to be thresholding. Whatever I think is, happens to be true about the nature of that system. Okay. Once I've done that, I can now stick those. I can randomly sample those. I can stick them back into my model. And I, I can actually do computing. But I've not constrained my computing to a single particular guess about how the system functions but I've constrained it to behave in a way that is consistent with what I know to be true or believe to be true about how the system uh, functions, but without over-constraining it. Okay. So I select a system architecture. I can select more than one to compare. I can sample random functions here. It's no more, di it's no, it's no more complicated than sampling parameter estimates from a, a space of parameters. I get random functions. I run the model. I integrate it. I get an uncertainty bound on what's happening. And now I can say that because I have not constrained my process parameterizations to anything other than what is what uh, obeys physics, this is the extent to which my system architecture has constrained the output of the system. And therefore, I can compare different system architectures without having to worry about whether I got the right process parameterization equations. Okay. I can use likelihood measures to compute performance. That's a whole technical detailed discussion which I won't go into here unless you ask me questions about it. Um, I can study the uncertainty. I can reflect that using entropy metrics. So I've got likelihood metrics. I've got entropy metrics. Technical details about how to do that. And I can now look at different system architectures. Here's my first architecture. And I'm trying to in improve the performance. I'm trying to go towards zero. I'm trying to reduce uncertainty. I'm trying to go towards zero. Here's architecture one. Clearly, architecture two is better than architecture one. Uh, architecture three improves performance, but increases the uncertainty. All of a sudden, I need new information. Is that a trade-off I'm willing to make or not? Do I, do I have access to the information that I need to do this? 
we can go even further. Um, let's say this is the sample of different uh, possible uh, equations that I that I, uh, I I postulated and tried. I can then do Bayesian updating to back out and say, you know what, the equations that most give the highest weight to the data are these from all the others, and so possibly my equation has a form that looks something closer to this than every other than all the other possible uh, uh, things that I've tried. I can then put a mathematical representation on that, and I can do parameter estimation and all the standard things that I want to do. With one interesting caveat, and that is that in reality, you will notice that when I actually interrogate the system with data, most of my data might be only down here, right? Let's say I've got a flood forecasting model. I may have very few occasions where I've actually um, um, triggered this part of the model. And so now I can more accurately reflect the fact that I have a lot of confidence in the shape of the form of the process equation here, but very little confidence in its shape over here. So when I use it to make a prediction, I can reflect that uncertainty in my predictions accurately. Whereas in the standard way, it's the same uncertainty everywhere along the equation. So the result is hopefully a strategy that would enable us to investigate structural hypotheses about the systems without making strong assumptions. And of course, in principle, you could apply the same basic idea. So the basic idea is maximum entropy, right? Meaning put in only enough information into the system to constrain it in a way that you can feel very confident that the system behaves like this. And then everything else, you try to leave it out and you sample it randomly from distributions so that uh, you can then use your data to help you constrain that uncertainty later on. So you never over-constrain the system if you do this right, in principle. Uh, so in that sense, as a scientific process, it builds more honesty and rigor into the model building process. Uh, it builds into the model clarity regarding what we feel certain and uncertain about. You're reflecting that accurately in your model. And we're clear about what is known versus what is a hypothesis or an assumption. Uh, call that a maximum entropy approach to model building. Okay, just to summarize. So models and data codify information about the world. Hopefully we can agree a little bit more about what that means. In what sense do models and data codify information? Um, I've made the claim that information implies change and uncertainty. That's in fact how I would define information. About something, remember, it's always about something, right? So it may change, it may not change your uncertainty about something else, but it might change your uncertainty about this specific thing. <laughs> and you always have to be clear about that. Uh, that models are organized or built in a way that organizes hypotheses in a particular structure. For dynamical environmental systems, their conservation laws, system architecture, process parameterization, uncertainty. There might be some minor variations on this, but so far I haven't come across any major ones. Um, your, model, your model hypotheses can either over-constrain your system or under-constrain it, typically both in some measure. And our job then is to try to navigate that problem. And one possible suggestion about how to do that is to use this approach, which we didn't invent. Uh, it was invented by Jaynes and a bunch of other statisticians, but we're trying to suggest is a useful approach to use when we do science, uh, uh, um, science about dynamical environmental systems, uh, using this maximum entropy approach. And then once we've done that, we can still use all the standard approaches, Bayes law and other kinds of tools that we have to do inference but hopefully use them in a much more informative way. Um, and by doing that, improve the way that we use our models uh, for doing scientific investigation. So, and thank you for that. Okay, thanks very much, Hoshin, for the stimulating and philosophical talk. We don't have much time left, probably just for a few quick questions. Okay, just stop for the microphone to come to you when you get a question, please. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really, really interesting. I was wondering about, from your experience, uh, if you have a, a particular system which is one equation, it seems relatively clear 
How do you go about when the system starts getting more and more complicated with a lot of equations? So how do you go about it? Um, so excellent question. Um, the problem is that you've got multiple hypotheses, different ones, right? Um, so we're only just starting to try to navigate how this approach might work. But off the top of my head, something that Sama, uh, Shervan has been trying is you might decide to constrain just one of those equations in the system. It would be like doing a sensitivity analysis on a parameter. You would now do it on a process representation. And you would then try to understand to what extent constraining that particular process representation actually drives your result in a direction closer to what your data says uh, might happen. Uh, maybe you could do those in combination. I don't know the answers to these questions yet. But I see, I see a sort of metaphorical analogy to what we did previously with parameter estimation. We're widening it to saying it's not estimation parameters. That's kind of a not interesting aspect of science, right? In, in you might even call it tuning. And some people hate tuning, right? It's, it's not science. We shouldn't be tuning our parameters. Uh, I, I sort of agree with them. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to tune our understanding. And that understanding is much better represented by the shapes of the forms of the equations than it is by the, the values of parameters, per se. Uh, sorry, not a perfect answer, but yeah. Any other question? Andrew. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Andrew, go first. Sorry, let you do it. Just on um, your um, relationships between the fluxes and the parameters, sorry, the gradients and the... Yeah parameters for those flux relationships. Do we really need to consider all of those multimodal kind of lines that you've potentially con included there? Or, or can we actually constrain constrain that to say a power law or maybe a bimodal power law? So I would say that's up to you, right? If you can, by, based on reasonable arguments about how the world functions, smoothness constraints, for example, argue that, no, there's no step functions in my function. Uh, in generally, uh, it may be a monotonically increasing function, but I don't know the order of the function. You could then constrain yourself to only random functions which are monotonically increasing, but don't have to be quadratic or third order or fourth order. And you could try to let the data then tell you what that order is, or if the data can't tell you, you could retain them all until the data maybe can tell you, right? Rather than saying, well, the data can't tell me, so I'll just guess. So I think that's a, that's, that's a modeling decision, but it's an interesting modeling decision because it reflects you as a scientist making meaningful hypotheses about the nature of the world. Right. Yeah, uh, one of my colleagues, Martin Clark, has been complaining in one of his recent papers that very often uh, models are too heavily constrained by values that have been fixed by the developer of the model. And maybe they worked for that person under that one circumstance, but they prevent you from using the model to do something useful in your situation. So if, if instead we, we only constrain those equations to have forms that we know have to be more or less true, then maybe we can do a better job of having models that work better under a variety of circumstances. Because the physics presumably is physics still regardless of, and that's a hypothesis, but regardless of where we apply it. Thanks. Hey, Dick. Hoshan, I'm wondering, um, can we turn this around to help us uh, know what to measure in the field? So a lot of the models with rainfall runoff, you know, you use a, a hydrograph and many of the other things we bring to bear to evaluate the model, so a moisture, groundwater fields, it's all related to the hydrograph and it's not necessarily really useful additional information, but it's additional information. So right. I guess I'm wondering, how could this help us think about, you know, more orthogonal measurements, things that are non-redundant? That I think that's something we, we struggle with. Uh, absolutely. Um, I don't think we're going to be saying anything new here because, because field people have been saying this for a long time and models have been saying this for a long time. But what I think we can do is we can quantitatively show that, yes, one more stream flow value is not going to give you anything useful, but one more measurement of a state variable or uh, 
something else happening in the watershed is going to be hugely informative because it constrains the system in useful ways. And, and so in that sense, yes, it should inform our... our uh, if we use this sort of um, inward, progressive, constraining approach, we can ask the question, what's the one measurement that's going to reduce my uncertainty the most amount without violating what the system is telling me is happening? Yeah. I think that's absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Students in class, uh, this is a good opportunity to ask a quick question. Okay, so last one for all of them. Thanks so much for your interesting talk. I just want to know, how do you consider the evolving of uncertainty in the models? Which strategy you consider for evolving this uncertainty in the models? For so, uh, solving the equations and we so should the question, start it from. The uh, question is, how, do we, how, are we, how are we choosing to represent uncertainty and then evolve the uncertainties as we get new information? Um, so right now, we're just proposing a Monte Carlo approach. Uh, I'm not claiming that Monte Carlo is the right approach or the best approach. It's actually a simplified representation of how uncertainty actually would be represented in a system. Um, Grainiering has proposed using uh, things like Gaussian process representations where you can evolve probability distributions and directly do computation using distributions. A little bit complicated for me, but, but if he can prove it works, more power to him. Right. So right now we're just using what I think is the simplest way that you and I can understand it, which is I just randomly sample a function, and then I check to see if that combination of randomly sampled functions looks does anything like what happens in the real world. If it does, I keep it. If it gives me some weird behavior, I say, that's obviously not a reasonable combination. Throw it away, try again. Can we optimize that? Maybe, you know, using some of the techniques that Jasper has developed using Monte Carlo optimization. or it may, There may be all kinds of interesting tools that we can bring to bear. Yeah. But instead of doing it on parameters, now we're doing it on what I think is interesting, which is relationships. Okay, I was about to stop, but Razi has a quick question, huh? Yeah. Okay. The, the last question, maybe it's a follow-up for of Jeff's question. So this kind of idea reminds me of uh, the Darwinian approach, looking system as a whole and finding the general uh, understanding of system, but how we can relate this to the Newtonian approach, which want to understand the, the maybe local uh, processes in the system, how it can help us to improve our understanding. Well, arguably, we're not throwing away the Newtonian approach because we're still saying I'm going to decompose my system into components, right? Uh, but we're then asking the question as to which components are important and necessary to represent the behaviors that we want to represent. Yeah. And if and if you're a if you're a biologist, you might make a different choice than if you were an ecologist. You might make a different choice than if you were a soil engineer and so on and so forth. So I don't think there's any correct way to do it necessarily, except that it helps better answer the question that you're trying to study. Okay, I so. think we are at a very good point to stop. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there are more questions. And from here, we're heading to Boffins. So this time, instead of uh, Alexander, we're going to Boffins, which is close by here. And we can continue the discussion over there. Uh, so. Another note is that so next week the lecture will be back to Convocation Hall, not here. Uh, we'll see you there. So thanks very much, Hoshin, for coming. It was great to have you here.